First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Kingsbury College, can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing to find out about one of your courses. Yes. Is that a daytime or an evening course? Evening. Right. I'll just get a few details from you, if I may. Fine. Could I have your full name, first of all? It's Peter Wright. That's W-R-I-G-H-T. OK. And I don't need to know your exact age, but can you tell me which of these age groups you belong to? 18 to 25, 26 to 35... 36 to 45, or over 45? 18 to 25. Fine. And do you have a job, or are you a full-time student? I'm an accountant. I just do courses in my spare time for interest. OK. Right. And your address, Mr Wright? It's 11 Forest Road. F-O-R-E-S-T? Yes. Mm. Is that in Kingsbury? Yes, it is. I'm just down the road here. And do you have a phone number? It's 992-471. That's my home number. I haven't got a work number. That's fine. We probably won't need it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, you want to register for a course? Yes, cookery. Do you happen to know the exact title of the course? We've got Thai cookery on Wednesdays, or Mexican cookery on Fridays, or... Mexican. I'd like to do both, but I'm busy on Wednesdays. OK. Well, you can always do the other one next term, I suppose. Now, do you know when it begins? Is it the 26th of March? That's right. And it's £45 in total. That's including the ingredients. How would you like to pay? Card? Cash? Can I send a cheque? You can, yes. As long as it arrives at least one week before the start of the course. OK. And I'll just give you a reference number. If you could make a note of it and write it on the back. Yes. It's CZ943. Yes, got that. Good. Well, there's just one last question. Do you have any special requirements that I should make a note of? Yes, there is one thing. I use a wheelchair. Right, so you need to have access for that. OK. Don't worry, your room is on the ground floor and I'll make sure there are no steps involved. We can always put a ramp in. Thanks. So, we look forward to seeing you on the 26th of March. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a driving instructor. First, look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully. Hello, I'm going to be your driving instructor today. Are you ready to begin? Hi. Hope you don't mind. It's my first time driving a car. Of course not. That's my job. I teach people like you how to become a safe and responsible driver. So let's begin. Remember the most important rule of driving: safety first. There are some steps to follow. First, you should put on your seatbelt. You should always remember to do that. In case of an accident or emergency, having a seatbelt on is of utmost importance. Okay, I have my seatbelt on. Now, what should I do? Start the car. Good. Now make sure that the steering wheel is in the proper position, and that your seat is not too far or not too close to the pedals. I'm all ready to go. Should I shift into first gear? Don't forget to put the parking brake down. You don't want to drive with that up. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. If I have the parking brake on, I won't be able to accelerate. Yes, that's right. Now put the car in reverse and slowly back out of the parking space. Good. Put the car in first gear. When should I shift? Is it better to shift slowly or quickly? You can shift whenever you feel is appropriate. This means shifting should occur smoothly. Do not shift too slowly, or you will stall. Shifting too fast will waste gas. Shifting is simple. Just remember to shift smoothly. To shift, you will have to push the clutch and then push the gas pedal. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. Remember, smoothly is the key to good shifting. Like this? Yes, that's good. Now keep it slow. Don't drive very fast just yet. Be sure to constantly check your mirrors for oncoming traffic. Always be aware of everything that is around you, including three important things. Remember these three. People crossing the streets, other cars, and bicycles riding next to you. What should I do if I see a yellow light? Well, it's always better to brake instead of trying to run it. But if you're travelling at a speed where it's impossible to stop in time, then you should try to make it across the intersection. But remember, you should always try to stop. It's the safest way to avoid an accident. Even if I have to brake very suddenly. Yes, even if you have to brake suddenly. What about if a driver behind me is going a lot faster than I am? You should always be ready to move to a slower lane if a driver behind you is forcing you to go faster than you are comfortable with. Never try to speed up to accommodate a faster driver. You could risk an accident or a speeding ticket. It's better to let him go. That sounds like good advice. Be careful. There is a sharp turn up ahead. Remember to brake before turns. Otherwise, you might flip over if your speed is too high going into a turn. Got it.
I know that I should always try to observe all traffic safety. That's right. If safety is not your first priority, it will make driving very dangerous for you and other drivers on the road. OK, park the car here. You did a great job today for your first day. I'll see you in three days. Thanks so much. I will see you then. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear two university students discussing a social science lecture they attended. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Did you go to the first social science lecture yesterday? Yeah. Didn't you see me there? No. I was trying so hard to understand the lecturer. What didn't you understand? A lot of it, really. For example, he said we needed to study history as part of the course, but I didn't get why. You probably missed it. He said early on that we need to learn from our past mistakes. Right. But he also said we need to put ourselves in the place of our ancestors. Why is that? I think the point is that it's not enough to know how they lived and what they did. We need to know what they thought. I see. And I've written transferable skills in my notes next, but I have no idea what that means. If you study social science, you learn skills that you can use in a job. Oh, right. Is that all? Okay, but why is that? The point he made was that in studying social science, you use a flexible and adaptable approach to learning. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. He also kept mentioning all the other subjects we will need to study as part of the course. I didn't write them all down, did you? Some of them. I think I can make sense of my notes. The first one was anthropology, which he said would cover prehistory and archaeology as well. Okay. Then there's economics. I wrote down that this was not meant to mean that we will spend all our time looking at economic theory, but more that we need to see how humans behave. That's good. I don't think I could handle economic theory. He said something about education too, didn't he? Yeah. He said we'll be looking at how cultural information is handed down from one generation to the next through teaching children. He said we'd be focusing on geography, too, but I can't really remember which aspects. Can you? I noted it down, I think. Here we are, yes, particularly in relation to urban planning. It's law that I got confused about. I didn't understand why he linked that to economics. 
I think he meant that laws affect the way wealth is distributed. That makes sense. Now, what are the science wars? Okay, I did get that. The science wars are about how social science collects information. In sociology and social work, and in social science generally, they can only study patterns of behavior and observe. If you compare that to the way scientists work in physics or chemistry, it's very different because they use specific experiments that can be tested and which give concrete answers. Social studies is often accused of being unscientific. That's all. Okay, but it still looks like a good course, doesn't it? You don't have any regrets, do you? None at all. I'm looking forward to it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You're going to listen to a talk about tea in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. During the nineteen thirties, there was a popular song which had the title "Everything Stops for Tea," and to millions of British people, a restful cuppa is still an ideal way to relax for a few minutes from the rigors of the day. The English custom of drinking tea has its roots in the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries. When first imported to Britain, the exotic cha, cha, or cha, as the Chinese tea was variously called, was considered a man's drink to be enjoyed with colleagues at London coffee shops. These were popular meeting places for many walks of life: politicians, lawyers, poets, actors, and writers. Many London clubs began in this manner. And the famous Lloyd's Insurance underwriters started out as Lloyd's Coffee House. In 1706, the first coffee house that offered tea was Tom's Coffee House, owned by Thomas Twining. He realized that he needed to introduce an added attraction to compete with the many other coffee houses in London, and tea was rare, exotic, and extremely expensive. With these credentials. Tea became an exclusive drink, and enabled Twining to open a tea shop under the sign of the Golden Lion in the Strand. By the 18th century, the ladies of the more affluent classes were going China mad, using tea as an excuse for displaying their extravagant purchases of Chinese porcelain and Dresden tea sets. A comprehensive tea tray would consist of a teapot and stand. Tea cups and saucers, sugar bowl, milk jug, and basin for discarded tea and tea leaves. Tea was still expensive and kept in locked tea caddies. Skilled craftsmen fashioned caddies of carved inlaid woods fitted with crystal and precious metals. To ensure the servants weren't tempted by this priceless commodity, the caddy was kept locked, and only the mistress of the house held the key and prepared tea when guests came to visit. 
No well-brought-up young Englishwoman could consider herself socially acceptable unless she knew how to brew a proper cup of tea. As the 18th century progressed, changes in commerce and working hours resulted in the main meal of the day being taken much later in the evening. The prospect of lasting from breakfast until evening did not appeal to the Duchess of Bedford, who is usually credited with being the first to alleviate late afternoon hunger pangs by introducing a small four o'clock meal served with tea. With time, the light, wafer-thin toast or delicate white bread gave way to exotic fillings like tomato and egg, cucumber, chicken or potted shrimps, followed by buttered scones, crumpets or elegant pastries. The popularity of tea continued to spread, but it was not until 1839 that the first shipment of Assam tea, Indian tea was landed in Britain. A healthy trade with India was soon established, and tea clippers, like the Cutty Sark, now a museum in a dry dock at Greenwich, were reaching the peak of their sailing days. In 1879, the first limited shipments of Ceylon tea began to arrive, and by 1880, this had been firmly established alongside Indian and China teas, giving the broad range of teas that are available today. There have been few changes in three centuries of tea trading. London is still the centre, and indeed Twining still has a shop on the site of the original Tom's Coffee House at 216 The Strand. The name Twining has been linked with tea for over 280 years. Indeed, it was Richard Twining, in his capacity as chairman of the dealers of tea, who in 1784 persuaded Prime Minister William Pitt to reduce the high tax on tea, making the beverage more accessible to the general public. That is the end of part four. You now